Well, hello there. It's great to see you again. Welcome to this latest edition of the Ezra File. And as you know, it's been some time since the last edition of the Ezra File. But anyway, not to worry. All that matters is that we are here now. And uh, as you know, last uh, edition of the Ezra File, we said we started a, a bit of a series. We're looking at roadmaps to the present, how we can understand uh, where we are and how we can understand how to bear witness to Jesus Christ in the society in which we live. And if you remember, I said we we're going to look at three uh, three thinkers, three scholars on this subject and, and, and have a look at a little bit of, of what they've said. And so today we're going to look at the first of those three individuals. Uh, the roadmap that we're going to look at today is the roadmap by Leslie Newbegin. Now, those of you who are long term followers of the Ezra file, will be familiar with Leslie Newbegin. There he is, 1909 to 1998. We've devoted a whole episode to Newbegin, his life, and, and a, a little bit about his thought. Uh, so if you have missed that, then it's down there somewhere or across there somewhere, wherever it is. But please just uh, uh, scroll down and have a look and refresh your memory. But uh, anyway, suffi suffice to say for the moment, Leslie Newbegin, uh, he was a cross-cultural missionary. He had a career as a missionary in India. He went uh, in the sort of uh, pre-World War II. He went to India as a, as, um, as a Christian missionary. He went to a, a city called Kanchipuram, which is sort of southeast of India and uh, one of the most holy cities in India, apparently. And uh, what he used to do, one of the things that he did as a missionary was that he, uh, he sat with the Hindu priests. They would bring their Hindu scriptures in, in the original language, Sanskrit. And he would bring John's gospel in uh, in the original Greek. And, and, and they would sit there and they would they would bat around things and, you know, swap stories and swap ideas and have a look at one another's scriptures. And, uh, and that's what he did um, uh, uh, until they made him a bishop. Anyway, uh, but what a way to, to have a career. Eh? But anyway, when he was 65, he decided he would retire from the, what he thought was the foreign mission field. And he thought he would come home. and. Uh, when he got home, he got the shock of his life because he thought he was going back to a Christian country. He left a, a Christian country in the 1930s and, and, and he thought he was going back to one. But when he got back, he found that the United Kingdom and the West generally was an even bigger mission field than the one that he left in India. It was, a, it was actually a place that was harder to communicate the gospel in than the place in India that he'd left <laughs> and um, so that's what he decided to do he asked himself the question why is it like this uh, why has the United Kingdom why has the West become a mission field and so as a cross-cultural missionary he was used to asking questions about why people thought the way they thought and did the things that they did so he thought he'd apply the same methods here and he tried to understand the West Western culture as a mission field. And he found that what was taking place is that people were living in two worlds, two completely separate worlds. He called one of them the public world, one of them the private world. And in the public world, the public world, said Newbegin, is the world of facts. The facts are the facts. The facts are fact from Norm to Rome boy. Uh, Raphael Benitez, you know, fact, fact, uh, facts come from science. Science tells you the facts. Uh, facts are objectively true. Um, there's no belief, there's no personal faith commitment uh, involved in facts. So so, so, the, uh, so our culture tells us. Um, uh, instead, oh, sorry, uh, they are rather public truth. Uh, you can state the facts anywhere and no one will disagree with you. The facts are the facts. In contrast to that is the private world, said Newbegin. Private world, said Newbegin, is the world of values. Values are not facts. Um, values, things like uh, moral values, right or wrong, uh, good or evil. Uh, aesthetic values, what constitutes beauty, art, that kind of thing. These are placed in the private world. And the private world is of course where you find religion. Religion is confined not to the public world, but to the private world. Uh, that's where the gospel is in our culture. And uh, the private world is not a matter of objective knowledge, it's a matter of subjective belief. Uh, just what you happen to choose to believe in. Uh, and so therefore, 
the gospel religion is not a matter of public truth it's a matter of private opinion it doesn't rest on any facts it doesn't rest on any scientific basis therefore says our culture it's a matter of private opinion uh, you've got your religion i've got mine the guy down the road has got his uh, they never say i've got my maths you've got your maths and the guy down the road's got his maths but they do for the gospel that's because maths and science belongs to the public world the gospel religion belongs to the private world of optional belief and that's the world that's the culture says new beginning which we live and it's completely unique to us he said anywhere else you go in the world you will not find anything like it in india nothing like it in china wherever this is completely unique to western culture and so new begin when he got home he didn't he, he was supposed to be a man in retirement but actually it wasn't it wasn't a, he didn't retire from life he just entered a new phase and he asked himself the question well how did we get here how do we understand how we got into this situation and so new begin began to ask questions about where, where does all this come from and he and he found his answer he found a place to begin with this guy here if you want to understand why these things are the way they are today he said go back to the 17th century Go back to the 17th and the 18th centuries, actually. But anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll not make it too complicated. Go back to the 17th century and go back to this guy here, uh, the French philosopher René Descartes. And Newbegin says Descartes marked a turning point. He marked a turning point in the modern history of Western culture. And if you want to understand it, then you need to go back to Descartes. So why was Descartes so important? Well, Descartes basically asked himself this question. How do we know what's true? How can we know what's real? What can we hang our hats on? And Descartes, in the world that, in which Descartes lived, there was already an answer to that question. There, there, was, a, there was a generally accepted answer to the question of, of, of how you know something's true and it came from this guy here uh saint augustine augustine of hippo augustine of hippo was a man who, who had a brain the size of a planet and he, and he lived about a thousand years or so before before well over a thousand years before rene descartes and and, and augustine says if you want to know what's true follow this little phrase credo ut intelligam i believe in order that I may understand. Faith is the route to knowledge. And the credo in question, of course, was the credo of the Christian church, the credo of the Bible, the credo of the great creeds of the Christian church. Um, and, and St. Augustine put all this in place. He said, if you follow these, these things, the, the Bible, the creeds of the church, they provide a framework for understanding the great story that the bible tells the great story of the christian creeds with its center in the birth the life the death and the resurrection of jesus christ who is the word made flesh ultimate reality come into this world as a human person he said if you put that in place that provides a framework from which you can understand life the universe and everything if you commit to believing credo if you commit to believing the, the the biblical story that will lead you to truth that will tell you what, what is really the case and western culture hung its hat on saint augustine and on credo utin taligam an entire civilization was built for a, a thousand years but the world in which descartes lived was a changing world. Uh, what had held for a, a thousand years or so was beginning to change. Uh, Descartes lived in a world of new discoveries. And if you read Lesley New Begin, Lesley New Begin says probably the, the most important discovery was the discovery of the telescope. Uh, because the telescope told you something completely revolutionary, that the earth moved around the sun <laughs> uh, for hundreds of years you know you go look out your window and it, the sun rises in the east sets in the west and that's the way life is except it isn't because the sun stays the same and the earth moves 
and 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 new begins is this was like a shock wave through society you know what was once thought certain is now no longer the case and Descartes also lived in in um a time of religious warfare uh, the reformation had happened in the previous century and and one of the results one of the tragic results of the reformation was Europe's torn apart by religious warfare and people were thinking well maybe 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 it's not all that good after all maybe we need to think about something else maybe we can find a new place to start and so Descartes lived in a time of rising skepticism and Newbegin tells a, a story in, in his books uh, about a, a conference at the University of Paris and the conference is entitled can we escape skepticism and a young guy was there by the name of René Descartes. And Descartes said, yes, you can escape scepticism and I will show you how to do it. And the way that um, Descartes did it was to emphasize the rule of doubt. He assigned the priority to doubt. Uh, St. Augustine assigned the priority to faith, credo ut intelligam, I believe in order that I may understand. But Descartes, began to doubt he assigned the priority of doubt and he, and he said well what can what can i doubt you can doubt this you can doubt that yeah this didn't it and then suddenly dawned at him the only thing he couldn't possibly doubt was that he himself was doubting <laughs> um his mind was doing the doubting so therefore the only thing that was real was his mind he couldn't deny the fact that he was the one who was doubting the existence of the human mind. The existence of the human mind was the key to knowledge. And so Descartes came up with his own little saying, instead of credo ut intelligam, Descartes came up with cogito ergo sum, I think, I think, therefore I am the priority of the human mind. Through doubt, you can arrive at certainty. And Descartes said, actually, what form of knowledge can meet that standard? If the thinking human mind is the only certain thing, what form of knowledge goes along with that? And Descartes, of course, was a mathematician and we still use his mathematics today. When you draw a graph, you, you, you use Descartes' maths. Uh, and, and Descartes are the only standard that will meet the standard of the human mind. The only standard that cannot be doubted, that goes beyond doubt, is the standard of mathematics. Mathematics provides certainty. It doesn't rest on any faith commitments, said Descartes, allegedly. We'll look at that later on. It doesn't involve any faith commitment. It provides certain knowledge that the human mind can grasp. And of course, all of that had rocket fuel put behind it, uh, and it literally did become rocket fuel. It had rocket fuel put behind it, by the discoveries of Isaac Newton, uh, Newton's Principia Mathematica, the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Uh, you could understand the movement of pretty much anything by three separate um, simple mathematical laws. They explained everything. And of course, his, his theory of universal gravitation uh, helped you to explain how the very heavens themselves moved. Um, that's the world that Descartes lived in, and that's how he moved it forwards. And the world after Descartes, after Cogito Ergo Sum, looked like this. Uh, there you are, you can see that screen, I've put a, a black line right across it because I'm gonna split it in two. Um, Descartes introduced a dualism into Western culture. Credo ut intelligam brought things together. Cogito Ergo Sum, separated them out again and and the bit above the line the first category of the dualism was the category of the public world of scientific facts um, these come from mathematics they come from the scientific method and they are undoubtable or the word that Newbegin uses a lot indubitable these are undoubtable uh, and the facts science mathematics allegedly, involves no personal faith commitment. Um, they, you just grasp them with the mind and they lead you to objective truth. They lead you to certainty. Uh, that is the public world. And the bit below the line, 
the private world, uh, the private world of personal commitments. Uh, anything that involves a faith commitment is resigned to the private world. Uh, it's, the, it's the world of optional values. It's the world into which the gospel is placed. Uh, the gospel doesn't belong above the line in the public world of facts, it belongs below the line in the private world of optional choice, the private world of subjective values. And those two worlds are completely separate from one another, uh, hence the thick black line. That's the world that Descartes um, bequeathed to us. And actually, you might think, well, John, isn't all that a bit abstract? You know, it's, it's a bit sort of sort of airy, fairy, philosophically, philosophically and all that. Does it have any real world significance? Well, actually, it does. It, it, it has a powerful real world significance. People are influenced by it. They perhaps don't even, they, they certainly, they don't, wouldn't be able to explain it to you. That most people couldn't articulate it to you, but it, but it has a powerful effect on people. Uh, and, and here's how I would say it works out. If I go into a pub or any public place and I said, yeah, I've just come here to say to you today that one and one equals two, people will say to me, well done, Vicar. Uh, you've got all level maths, haven't you? I go back the next day and I say, I just come to tell you that the earth rotates around the sun. And they'll say, well done, Vicar. You've got the facts straight. Your facts are straight. And I go back the third day to them and say, well, uh, I've just come to tell you here today that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And they will say to me, ah, Vicar, but that's just your opinion. Uh, those first two statements belong above the line. They're the public world of truth, the public world of mathematics and science. The second word, the, the third statement, the green statement in our culture belongs below the line. Uh, that's a religious statement. It's a matter of faith commitment. Therefore, it's optional. Um, that statement, Christ has been raised from the dead, is no more or less true than the statement, Christ was not raised from the dead. And that is what dominates our culture. And that is what makes it so hard to bear witness to Jesus Christ today. If you talk to your friend or your neighbor, your non-Christian friend or your non-Christian and you feel uncomfortable about it, you feel exposed over it, you, you're not quite sure, why are you like that? Why do you feel that? And that's why. It's the world that Descartes bequeathed to us. And your neighbor might well say, well, that's interesting, John, but you can't prove it. There's no proof. Why do they say that to you? Well, it's the world that Descartes bequeathed to us. And that's the world that Leslie Newbegin set himself to tackle. He said, if that's the world that we live in, how do we do it? How do we bear witness to Jesus Christ? How do we deconstruct all of that to bear witness to Jesus Christ? And if you want to know how Newbegin tells us to do it, well, you'll need to come back to the next episode when we look at part two of the roadmap of Leslie Newbegin. Until then, be seeing you.